um, which could be summarized as, you know, try and avoid damaging the, the thing. Uh, if you do damage, try and undo it. Uh, and if it's too late for that, uh, what are the alternative plans? Um, basically, we have a pretty limited number of tools in the toolbox, which makes life easier. Imagine if we had lots of different things we could do, we'd have to think much harder. So anatomy, I mean, I'm not going to go through the whole course of the facial nerve. Um, it, you know, it's something that's probably easier found in a book or doubtless online. Um, but basically, I'm going to concentrate on the bit within the temporal bone. Um, I think, you know, the intracranial bit uh, and the uh, extracranial bit are probably less um, fun. Uh, and I guess we're, this is sort of a talk with more of a view of otology, neuroautology, rather than um, head and neck or neurosurgery. Uh, just a few little points and tips that I think are helpful in terms of anatomy. So, um, basically, uh, there are a couple of fixed points for the facial nerve, basically one at either end of the bit where you normally find it when you're doing ear surgery. Um, and it's important to know those landmarks well and have them um, because when disease is masking everything going on and you're looking at an ear that's a hell of a mess and you can't tell where the facial nerve is, you have to have some sort of reference points that you can go to, preferably not destroyed by disease. So one of those is the cochleariform process. Ooh, my, uh, my mouse doesn't show on this, which is slightly disappointing, but anyway. Um, so cochleariform process, which has, so the red line there is um, tensor tympani, which runs up from the eustachian tube uh, to the cochleariform process and the yellow line is the course of the facial nerve. So basically those are two sort of intersecting relatively straight lines with a nice little sticky outy thing where they join of the uh, tensor tympani tendon um, at the cochleariform process. And it's very rare for disease to completely destroy that. Uh, so basically at your sort of upstream end of mastoid surgery, you have a kind of relatively reliable um, sort of robust landmark for finding the facial nerve. It's always just above the cochleariform process uh, in the middle ear, even if all else seems to be lost. It, that's where it will be. Um, oh, yes, videos work. Oh, hey. So you can ignore the uh, rather clumsy uh, movements, clearly not an expert in endoscopic ear surgery, but anyway. But what you can see is the cochleariform process at the top there. I can't move my uh, cursor to show you. And the facial nerve running from just above where I'm fiddling uh, up kind of obliquely just past the cochleariform process. Enough of that. The tympanomastoid suture, disappointing that I couldn't find a bit of video which demonstrated this, but we all know when you in the neck or doing parotid surgery, you say, well, it comes out in the line of the tympanomastoid suture at the depth of the uh, digastric ridge. But those are also landmarks that you see in the bone. So tympanomastoid suture being the, um, you know, where the tympanic ring, which forms the floor, uh, lower part of the posterior canal wall and anterior canal wall, fuses with the uh, mastoid process. Um, so that is the suture line. When, you know, when you're raising the skin uh, down the ear canal, that is the suture line that the skin uh, catches on. You know, sometimes when you're just raising the skin off as, uh, from a posterior incision and it's sort of caught along that little line, well, that is the line of the tympanomastoid suture, which is the line that you use as your landmark for finding the uh, nerve when you're doing parotid surgery. So that's roughly the, the, the line that the nerve is running in. And the relevance of that really comes if you're doing um, canal plasty, which is the procedure of bony canal plaster with the highest iatrogenic facial nerve injury rate. Um, because basically there often aren't a lot of landmarks, but there is one, which is that suture line. Um, so the, the facial nerve may be lying lateral to the annulus and that's what puts it in danger. But if you kind of are conscious of the suture line, it should minimize the risk of clobbering it there. And I think maybe people don't think of that or, or recognize what that annoying line is. So that's, that's my other little top tip. 
Digastric ridge, I think, is, is a massively misunderstood thing. So here's a classic um, picture that you see from a textbook. And this DR at the bottom is digastric ridge. And it's portrayed in this book, or it's been manufactured by the person who did the dissection, as a bony ridge uh, sticking into an air-filled mastoid. But obviously, in reality, in the ears that you operate on, almost invariably they have a slightly sclerotic mastoid. And the tip tends to be pretty solid. And it's pretty impossible to find a bony ridge, uh, although it's quite easy to sort of manufacture one. But what you can find and what you should be looking for is not the bony ridge, but the fibrous insertion of the muscle. So the digastric ridge is not a ridge of bone. You're not looking for a ridge of bone. Um, you know, that, that's futile. You'll just manufacture loads and confuse yourself. You're looking for a fibrous ridge, which is actually made of muscle. So it's an absence of bone. And that ridge blends into the line of the facial nerve. So if you have a right angle between that ridge and the bit of bone you're drilling, then you can be confident that the bit of your bone you're drilling does not have the facial nerve anywhere near it. You see what I mean? So basically you follow the ridge forward and it leads you into the line of the nerve. And what that means is you can, you can go basically quite quickly until the ridge starts to curve up to the line that you expect the facial nerve to be following. And at that point, you might be allowed to stop using a large cutting burr. And then the other thing that I think people um, perhaps slightly kind of um, picture incorrectly in their head is one tends to think of the temporal bone as a sort of um, cubic structure, i.e. with a sort of vertical posterior fossa and a sort of horizontal uh, middle fossa, um, I guess, I'm trying to think what the actual shape would be, well, like a pyramid whatever. But in practice, the middle fossil floor is not a horizontal thing. So here's a fairly sort of standard uh, CT picture. And of course, the gray thing in front of the ear is the temporal lobe, um, which sort of slopes down. So you can see when you look at pictures like this, how it can be the case that you can have a dehiscence. It's really annoying that my cursor, oh, there it is. Yeah. So you can have a a dehiscent geniculic ganglion at this point, uh, whilst the labyrinthine portion of the facial nerve is still fairly encased in bone. You know, the floor, the roof of the temporal bone slopes down. Um, and we tend to sort of refer to this um, middle ear uh, tympanic portion of the facial nerve as the horizontal segment, which is slightly misleading because it's not quite horizontal. Um, and certainly, you know, it's angled away from the roof of the temporal bone or the floor of the middle fossa. So facial nerve scoring systems, of it, I'm not really going to go through this. Obviously, there are lots of facial nerve scoring systems. In practice, we do use the Sunnybrook uh, score in our facial nerve clinic because it's a better way of monitoring what's happening, particularly with reference to scene kinesis. Uh, and that tends to be the problem we're often managing. But in reality, there's only one uh, scoring system really um, in town, which is the House Brackman scoring system, or the sort of bastardized version of it that's become widespread. Um, and that is the one that every uh, A&E doctor and neurosurgeon uh, thinks they know. And hopefully every ENT surgeon does know. Um, but basically, it, you know, it was designed as a score for measuring outcomes from vestibular schwannoma surgery, um, ideally at about a year, which, you know, having given the time, nerve time to recover. So it, it's, it, it's prone to giving confusing results when used on my, in the shorter term, I'm being harassed um, by a big brown dog. Um, Away. Back off. Um, sorry. So here's the facial. Here is the uh, House Brackman um, 
system. And what I would like you to appreciate is quite how much text there is in this uh, right hand column. Okay. So if you say to uh, people, tell me what the House Brackman grading system is, the classic response is they'll say it's the scoring system used to define the uh, facial nerve function, which is graded from one to six, with one being completely normal and six being complete paralysis. And the distinction between three and four is to do with whether or not you can close your eye. Okay, that's, that's the normal uh, registrar approaching the exam answer to what is the House Brackman grading system. And that is also what uh, a neurosurgeon who thinks they know it will probably tell you. But actually, there's a lot more subtlety there. Um, eye closure is not the overriding distinction between uh, three and four. You, you know, basically two is a hint of weakness. Three is, says obvious but not disfiguring. I think a lot of people would argue that uh, an obvious weakness is disfiguring, but I think one can sort of understand what they're on at. Five, there's only a hint of movement. And four is, well, it's more than a hint, but it's pretty bad. That, the main point is that the eye is a completely misleading thing uh, to use. Now, the reason the eye is misleading is because um, the eye is opened by uh, levator palpebrae superioris, which is obviously innervated by the oculomotor nerve, so not affected by uh, facial palsy. It's closed by two things. One is active uh, contraction of orbicularis oculi, uh, and the other is a passive mechanism involving uh, largely the, the elasticity of the tissues. Um, and, you know, the way any sort of pair of muscles works is, you know, they only contract, so they have to be stretched back to length by opposing muscles, okay? Um, so, you know, that's why muscles work in pairs. Okay, so if you give someone an immediate uh, facial palsy or they fall off their bike or whatever, or you go and see them in recovery and you ring up the boss and say, oops, um, immediately after the onset of the facial palsy, that levator muscle has not been contracting lots without being stretched back to length. So it is still a long uh, sort of relaxed muscle. And the tissues have not been continually pulled in one direction without being pulled the other way, so they are not stretched. And it is highly likely that the person will be able to close their eye, okay? So basically you say, ooh, blimey, they've got a facial palsy. Can you close your eye? And they close one eye actively and the other eye closes passively but reasonably promptly. So they're not getting big wrinkles around and things, but the lid goes down. The lower lid is still, again, nice and sort of tight. and you know, they close their eye. And I've had uh, neurosurgeons, you know, tell me after we have together intentionally cut the nerve out, they say, oh, well, she's got a grade three face, not bad. And you just think, you know, don't be an idiot. Um, after a little bit of time has passed, uh, the levator muscle contracts, okay, it's unopposed, the, the, um, orbicularis oculi has not been pulling it back to length so it's got gradually it's got shorter and shorter and shorter the tissue has become stretched as that muscle gets shorter and shorter the lower lids kind of fallen away you know they uh, cease to be able to close their eye so you then go to see the patient two days later and say oh well now it's no longer a grade three now it's a grade six uh, they must have a delayed onset uh, facial palsy presumably it's a bit of swelling Okay, so, you know, just ignore the patient's eye, please, all right? If you just ignore the eye and grade for the purposes of grading their facial nerve function and look at everything else, you will give a much more reliable answer. Um, so there we go, sorry. Personal pet hate. So there's the system, all right? There's more to it than just... Uh, 
whether or not your eye can close. Okay. Of course, <laughs> whether your eye can close is actually very important because, you know, if you've got someone with an acutely flaccid face, basically eye care is, is the most important thing you can provide for that uh, patient in the short term. Um, you know, people get blinded by corneal ulcerations um, as a result of facial palsy, particularly if they have um, a loss of sensation as well. So, you know, it's, uh, it is a big deal. I'm not suggesting you ignore that eye, just don't use it to grade their facial palsy. Um, and how do we manage that? Well, obviously, uh, lots of lubrication. Um, even if they say their eye is watering, they still need more lubrication. And you put something thin in during the day um, and something thick in at night. So they don't have to be woken up every two hours through the night for some nurse to put watery eye drops in because they're not looking or seeing at night. They can have something thick that will last um, that would smear their vision if they try to look, but that's not an issue. Um, the lower lid you know, tends to sort of fall away um, from the globe. So, you know, that can be held up with a little bit of tape along the lower lid to sort of provide a bit of tension. Um, and the upper lid can be taped or you, an external eyelid weight is a really nice thing for someone who has a flaccid palsy. We have got funding from the guy's charity to buy a load of these weights. It, it kind of came through just as a lockdown happened, so we haven't actually done it yet. But there are going to be some weights that we can use to lend to patients um, because in, if you needed a long-term weight, you'd have or a long-term treatment to uh, facilitate eye closure, you wouldn't use an external weight. But they're a really good way of both keeping that muscle long because you're providing a weight to sort of stretch it out and improving comfort in the short term. Um, with some patient with an acutely flaccid face, the tendency will be also for the muscles around the mouth to contract on the good side because they're also not being pulled to length. So stretching the good side, the contralateral side is what you do acutely. Um, and sometimes people use tape to support the angle of the mouth if they're um, dribbling. There is a charity, Facial Palsy UK, which has very good um, instructional videos including someone managing the acutely flaccid face floppy face i think they call it on the website okay so let's just talk a little bit about the pathologies um, that affect the facial nerve so basically the main um, one obviously is what we call bell's palsy um, so you know, viral etiology. Um, it's uh, obviously the tendency in medicine now is to get rid of people's names being attached to conditions. And here I have a load of them. But um, Bell's is more than just an idiopathic facial palsy because it has to have this sort of characteristic history going to that second. Obviously, Ramsey Hunt is also a relatively common cause. There are an awfully long list of other things that can cause facial palsies, um, most of which we never really see. Um, I have, I was going to say, I have picked up syphilis and HIV, but that's not quite accurate. You might get a misleading impression. I have had patients present with both syphilis and HIV uh, and facial palsies. Um, often the ones with syphilis actually know they've got syphilis, but don't tell you because they're embarrassed. Um, people with uh, vagueness will normally have more than just a facial palsy. So it's relatively obvious that I might have a middle ear effusion, a bit of sensory neural hearing loss. There's a sort of more complicated picture than just an isolated facial palsy. Um, and I suspect sarcoid is probably the thing we maybe miss uh, more than anything else. And then I've put down there this Melkerson-Rosenthal syndrome, which is a a variation of orofacial granulomatosis. Um, the oral medicine department manages lots of patients with orofacial granulomatosis. Most of them don't get facial palsy, but some do. They do have very characteristic uh, lip swelling generally. Um, and obviously there's the classic description of a fissured tongue in association with that. The fissured tongue, I think you look at lots of people's tongues and they look a little bit fissured, it's not so obvious, but the lip swelling of Merkel and Rosenthal, 
which basically in a cutis act they swell up an awful lot and then they settle down and they look like they've had really badly done lip filler um, and they haven't so just to go back to bell's palsy um bell's palsy and facial palsy you know not the same thing so we we still get loads of letters and lots of <coughs> doctors uh, you know playing the old sort of trick of a patient comes in and saying they've got one thing and you just use a different word for it and, and tell them that's what they've got um but it's obviously not synonymous bell's palsy and idiopathic facial palsy also not synonymous i mean obviously to label something but it is idiopathic in that we don't know 100 percent the cause but it's presumed uh, viral uh, reactivation in the geniculate ganglion um it does imply that you've considered other alternatives if you're calling it idiopathic um but basically a Bell's palsy has the characteristic history. So they have uh, a rapid onset over probably not more than 72 hours. There's no, you know, they haven't been clobbered on the head. There's no precipitating trauma. There are no vesicles that might suggest uh, Ramsey Hunt syndrome. They do typically have a, an ache or pain behind the ear, um, you know, often for a day or so prior to onset. The majority of patients notice their weakness in the morning. Um, perhaps something to do with being relatively horizontal overnight leads to more edema occurring at that point. You know, there may be some other symptoms like imbalance, sort of taste, hyperacusis. Um, and if one does a scan, you generally see enhancement in the labyrinthine and genicular area, suggesting that is the source of the, uh, or the epicenter of the inflammation, uh, but without that area being expanded. Um, so if they have a facial palsy and you can't find any other explanation for it you don't call it a bell's palsy unless it has those other features so uh, an idiopathic facial palsy that has come on slowly is uh, must be assumed to be secondary to uh, malignancy um, even if you've done a, uh, an mri with contrast and you've done a pet and you've done everything else and you can't find anything you would still assume that it's a malignancy and that you just haven't yet found the cause. So typically what you do is uh, interval imaging, you know, perhaps at three months, um, something like that. And if that still looks normal, then you just do it again and keep going until you find a cause, uh, which will become apparent, you know, probably within a year. So how do we treat all, the, all these, well, it doesn't really matter which one of those viral um, or inflammatory uh, causes, you're basically going to give them a lot of steroids. The evidence, you know, the trials uh, rarely were either 50 milligrams uh, for 10 days or uh, 60 milligrams for five days and then a weaning dose. But I would advocate in patients who don't have any other um, reason not to be on high dose steroids, that we use a, a slightly more generous dose. Um, if someone has an injury to other nerves, you know, they particularly spinal cord, they will be given, um, you know, doses uh, orders of magnitude bigger than anything we're using. So you might say, oh, you know, this guy's quite big. I'm going to give him, really going to give him 90 milligrams of PRED. But, you know, if he kind of had even a contusion of the spinal cord he'd be getting you know several grams um so i think you know we don't need to worry excessively about going up to one milligram per kilogram it's still not uh, a huge amount um obviously the evidence for antivirals is a bit more debatable uh, I would say that it probably should be given to anyone with a complete facial palsy, even if they don't have obvious vesicles. The vesicles of Ramsey Hunt don't always appear uh, at the same time as the facial palsy or even prior to it. So it's not that uncommon for someone to get vesicles maybe five days after they got the facial palsy, um, at which point you have perhaps slightly missed the boat in terms of antivirals. So, you know, I, th I think that's... Uh, justified by the evidence um 
And then, you know, basically managing their eye, tell them not to panic. Um, and the facial palsy website is a good source of support and advice. Uh, they don't need uh, imaging at presentation. Um, the American Academy came out with some best practice guidelines on this two years ago, and they also agreed, um, you know, imaging was not indicated uh, acutely, uh, and neither was referral to a specialist service unless there is a failure of the, well, unless they meet one of these criteria. So basically, not recovering within three months uh, suggests this, well, raises a concern that something else going on. They've got recurrent facial palsy, you know, clearly, again, that's uh, unusual. Um, or if there are um, atypical features, you know, it's not quite your classic bells, um, maybe it came on a little bit slowly. Uh, certainly, if it's not the whole face, that's very suspicious. If other nerves are involved, you know, anything, if it's not a classic bells and it's just idiopathic, well, you need to. Uh, look for a cause, otherwise you can't label it idiopathic. So uh, the, there's no point doing electrophysiology unless one is considering decompression. Um, and decompression, I think, is something that, you know, we as a service at uh, Guys and Tommies will offer for uh, patients who uh, meet the criteria. So basically they would need to have, a, you know, completely flaccid palsy, um, and which point we would then get um, electrophysiology, and that would need to show um, no voluntary motor potentials. So that's where they put the needle in the muscle uh, and get them to smile or try and smile and, and see whether anything uh, fires off on those electrodes. Um, and greater than 90% denervation relative to the other side or ENOG, which is where you electrically stimulate the nerve peripherally, um, and look for a response. So that's suggesting uh, degeneration. And that test um, is normally would be done ideally uh, more than 10 days. Uh, so somewhere around the sort of 10 to 20 day um, mark. Um, there's much debate about, about timing of decompression, um, but it doesn't have to be sort of, you know, instant. Um, and the other people who we would consider decompression for would be if they had recurrent facial palsy. Uh, and this was their third or subsequent episode. So I think if someone's got, um, if it keeps happening, then it doesn't have to be quite so bad to justify decompression because basically you would offer them a elective decompression anyway um if they're getting recurrent episodes of facial palsy and you know if you're going to be doing the operation anywhere well why not do it uh whilst the nerve is acutely swollen because you might improve their recovery from that particular episode so let's talk a little bit about the other pathologies that might be affecting the facial nerve so basically there are things that might be either invading or squashing it um I've debated whether to put vestibular schwannoma there. I mean, the main way vestibular schwannoma causes facial palsy is by it being treated. It's extremely rare for a vestibular schwannoma to be associated with a facial palsy. It's not impossible, particularly if someone bleeds into the tumor or something like that, and there's a rapid change, but it's very rare. But meningioma will more frequently be irritating the nerve, and um, perhaps initially hemifacial spasm and then weakness. Obviously, cholesteatoma can be associated with it. Parotid tumors, you know, the adenoid cystics are the classic for um, perineural spread, and SCCs, you know, with direct um, invasion. And then there's the intrinsic things uh, arising within the nerve that would classically call a gradually progressive weakness. So we're just going to talk a little bit about how you address those two things. I mean, obviously, we have, much as I might think the facial nerve is the most important thing out there, obviously, if there's malignancy, you need to treat malignancy. Um, and if that involves resecting the facial nerve, then fine. Um, but it is sensible to consider how you're going to manage their face afterwards, you know, uh, and it may be that you, that you know, you do a resection and put in a vascularized nerve graft, 
or do something like a nerve to acetyl that's pretty simple uh, at the same time, or just a static sling, you know, may, may well be um, appropriate. But, you know, you don't tiptoe around the facial nerve trying to preserve function if they've got a cancer that is already affecting the facial nerve. The implication is that, you know, if they've got a cancer and the, the facial nerve is unaffected, well, you can probably preserve it. But once it started to go, well, it's probably uh, stuffed. The other um, external things, well, so how do we manage uh, a facial, deteriorating facial function in the context of one of these other things? The, the problem essentially is that the more irritated the facial nerve is by the disease, the greater the likely the risk of making it worse by removing the disease. So, I mean, with a cholestitoma, uh, the, the, the odds are pretty good that you'll be able to peel the, the cholestitoma off the nerve and the function will recover. Um, you know, it doesn't generally invade, it's just causing local compression. Um, but with something like a meningioma, you have a real dilemma because the nerve will generally be running through the tumor. If the nerve is completely happy and unaffected, then the odds of being able to get the tumor out without damaging it are quite good. But there's still a chance that you damage it when you do the operation and it's not really causing a problem, so why not just leave it alone? But once they start getting uh, really disabling hemifacial spasm or weakness, then there's much more indication to remove the thing, but the risk of doing so has also gone up. So those are sort of trickier decisions. I'm not gonna tell you the answer because there, there isn't one answer. Um, in general, and with the paragangliomas as well, you know, generally you wanna get, take the tumor out before it starts causing them to have hemifacial spasm or facial weakness because once they've, if they've got a hint of weakness or spasm, the likelihood is you'll make it worse by removing the tumor. Obviously, once the tumor has destroyed the nerve, you can then remove it and put it in an interposition graft and that'll work. But it's those ones where it's sort of half working that uh, present the challenge. And for those, you might consider whether you'd be better off doing radiotherapy or sort of decompressing uh, to provide room so the nerve is not squashed, even if the tumor is still um, displacing it. And for those uh, intrinsic tumors like schwannomas, angiomas, neurofibromas, um, the standard uh, teaching, the correct answer for the exam, I imagine, is basically that you uh, manage the disease conservatively until the facial function has deteriorated to a, what, a grade four. So, you know, pretty rubbish, but not completely gone. And then remove the tumor and put in uh, an interposition graft. The assumption being that the outcome of an interposition graft would ideally be about a grade three. So, you, you know, wait till they've got worse than, um, well, wait till you can make them better, I guess is the argument. The problem being that interposition graft, of course, takes quite a long time to work. Uh, and when you resect the thing, you then, you know, knock them into the long grass for a good 18 months, uh, whilst hoping your interposition graft will work because, you know, they're not enormously reliable. Um, so basically, it's not, it's not a strategy that worked terrifically well, and there is scope for doing things better. So one option is, uh, rather than resecting the thing and then putting grafts in, you can put the grafts in first. So if you're going to do like a cross-facial graft, um, there's no point, wait. you don't need to wait for the uh, tumor to be removed before you do it. You can do that uh, years in advance and get it all up and running and then if necessary, remove the tumor without um, the facial function being affected in the same way. Um, similarly with uh, you know, nerve to masseter to, to facial anastomosis to give you a bit of a smile, uh, you know, there's no reason to wait for you to fiddle with your tumor in the skull. 
uh, before you do that, you can do that first and get it running. You know, they, all these things take many months to start working. So, you know, do it in advance. Um, Sometimes rather than actually resecting the tumor, you can actually just preserve function by giving it a bit more room uh, to grow. So, um, you know, decompressing the tumor. We know that, you know, facial schwannomas in the parotid uh, or, you know, extracranial outside or outside the mastoid can get to a huge size without facial function deteriorating um, because, you know, they're not uh, compressing the functioning facial nerve fibers. So, Essentially, if you can um, decompress the tumor, you can probably allow it to grow whilst preserving function. And it's extremely rare for one of these things to reach a size where its uh, mass effect is a, is a danger. A facial schwannoma is, you know, normally pretty small, um, and it doesn't really matter if they grow up. But, you know, there's a bit of room in your head, um, so they have to get quite big before you worry about mass effect. Um, with schwannomas, uh, in theory, it is possible, I mean, certainly in the neck, it's relatively straightforward to remove the tumor from the nerve whilst preserving the function of the nerve. But in the facial nerve, that's harder. There, is, there are some units around the world uh, that have presented pretty good results. Um, but they're not necessarily been replicated it tends to be single surgeons uh, and it, and then often when they retire the people who take over say well i don't know how we did that so we don't tend to try and remove facial schwannomas and preserve function because the bit of the nerve in the parotid is too branching for that to be straightforward and the bit well, it just generally doesn't seem worth it. You just make a bit of room. Anyway, so here is a guy with a facial schwannoma, a very dapper Italian. Are they all? Okay, so eyebrows raised, and um, rest. Eyes closed gently, and rest. Eyes closed tightly, and rest. And then your nose up. Yeah, so basically, look, his facial function is not that bad, really, is it? Um, he looks, um, he's clearly slightly wonky, but he, you know, so he's got a right-sided facial schwannoma, which has gradually been growing, and he's had gradual deterioration of function. So we put cross-facial grafts in, um, and he feels, without resecting the tumor or treating it with radiation or anything else, I mean, he's relatively young, he's got good hearing, um, and he feels that his function in the years since we put the cross facial graft in has gradually improved again. So, you know, seemingly the corner was turned and there's certainly no indication to do anything else. Um, as ever with these things, it's hardly a randomized controlled trial. So <laughs> I can't promise he wouldn't have got better anyway. Um, but I think it's better than resecting it and putting him into position graft in. What about trauma? We're talking of resecting facial uh, things. What about trauma? Temporal bone fractures. And this is where I guess we go back to that thing about how you grade a facial nerve. Um, because um, the standard teaching is that you explore an immediate complete fracture. Um, and the standard teaching is that the reason you do that is to remove or exclude a spicule of bone that might be sticking into the nerve and preventing it from recovering uh, and make sure the ends are in continuity. And that, that is what people have been saying for years. And it, I think you only have to say it to think, well, that doesn't really sound right, does it? If there was a big spicule of bone sticking in and penetrating the facial nerve. We would see it on our beautiful, fine, thin slice CT scan. And similarly, if the ends of the nerve were not in continuity, and they've just got a, a sort of temporal bone fracture, you know, 
again, you'd see it on the scan. You know, the, the thing would have to be so disrupted for the two ends of the fallopian canal to not be aligned with one another. Um, and really, that is providing the, as much continuity as we do with an operation. So th that kind of rationale for doing it, it seems slightly kind of spurious. Um, and then the other, well, the other thing is, of course, this idea that if it's an immediate complete palsy, you explore it, and if it's not, you don't. So when uh, you see that the uh, neurosurgical SHO said um, that the patient had complete eye closure, uh, and therefore it was a grade three, do you uh, think that that means that it's not an immediate facial palsy? Or is that meaningless? Uh, leave that to you. Um, it's, I mean, sometimes it's clear, you know, the whole face was moving, but often it's like, so, oh yeah, the eye was closed, it was grade three by the time anyone's looked. So I think what we actually do when we explore a temporal bone fracture is we decompress it and we allow the bruised nerve to swell uh, without it being pinched or trapped in this little bony channel. Um, and maybe that uh, allows a very damaged nerve to sort of sprout more successfully. But the other thing that um, you do is the, there's this sort of issue of people coming to see you later and saying, um, well, you know, this hasn't worked, it hasn't recovered, you know, can, what, can you do something now? And often um, the conclusion is, well, not really. Uh, the opportunity for intervening and changing the natural history of this was much nearer when the insult happened. Um, and even if it doesn't make any difference, at least you will feel that you have um, done what you could to get the best possible outcome. And that also applies, um, obviously, to the inflammatory um, cases. Um, so, obviously, there'll be people saying, well, that's rubbish. It's, there's no evidence to support um, decompression. And I would entirely agree that there is good evidence that decompression of the mastoid and horizontal segments of the nerve uh, is worthless, uh, certainly for patients with Bell's palsy. And also that a, ma a transmastoid approach, if you're trying to get that uh, uh, tympanic segment, uh, it, you know, is likely to be associated with hearing loss because of disruption of the acicular chain in order to get, uh, well, under the incus. Um, but, you know, the, using a middle foster approach does allow you to get uh, both the labyrinth and geniculic, and geniculic segments and the middle ear segment um, without disrupting the ossicles. And, and there is evidence to support uh, a middle fossil decompression of the facial nerve, although it's not most convincing. So why don't people do middle fossil decompressions? Well, you know, there are the stories that go around it basically is generally people say, well, it's dangerous and you can't drive for a year and you might wrap the nerve around the drill and ruin everything forever. And if you don't do it, they'll probably get better anyway. So that's basically not accurate. I mean, the main problem with uh, middle fossa de facial nerve decompression is that it's unfamiliar that most ENT surgeons, you know, are not comfortable doing middle fossa craniotomy. Um, and they're certainly not comfortable finding the facial nerve uh, through the floor of the middle fossa, you know, which is, I guess, understandable. Um, and if you think your neurosurgeon is going to show you where it is, then you're kidding yourself because, you know, they will make the window uh, and then say, well, over to you. So, you know, basically it's not something widely done in the UK and that's the main reason it doesn't get done. It's also the main reason if you're looking at that American best practice paper, they basically say, well, you know, Nobody really does this, um, uh, as in 95% of US neurotologists have done less than five in the previous 10 years. Um, 
and therefore you know that they don't have the practice and therefore it shouldn't be recommended but i think um as a sort of relatively coordinated nhs we it is probably something that should be offered by centralizing the relevant cases so as with any operation the, the thing is there's a there's a trade-off of risks versus benefits uh, for the operation so of course there are risks you know you can't do an operation without uh, risking bleeding or infection or a scar um, you know uh, I put a spot well, asked the anesthetist to put a spinal drain in for the duration of the operation so it comes out at the end of the operation but it draining off some CSF basically means you can retract and get access without uh, damaging the temporal lobe um but they do tend to get a cracking headache uh from the csf drainage in part it's nice to blame the anesthetist um and that can last for several days and occasionally people even need a little blood patch to stop that um you know so the headache can be pretty severe for about a week um there is a very small risk of hearing loss um but it's extremely unlikely they're going to get I mean, that's like a ear operation. You know, the risk of a dead ear is is pretty tiny. The risk of getting a little bit of high frequency, you know, slight drop at eight k is less tiny, but less significant. Um, there is a small chance of getting a CSF leak, but again, you know, it's not a major thing if they do. It can be treated, and it's uh, pretty unlikely. Um, and patients if they can reapply to the dvla after three months if they haven't uh, had a seizure um and i've even got a guy who's a bus driver who you know basically i said well you know we could do this but really you're a bus driver uh, and he talked it all through the, with the dvla and they basically said well you know if you don't have a seizure you can get back to work pretty quickly and if you do uh, your stuff, but as the likelihood of him having a seizure is extremely low, um, you know, he was more than happy to take that chance. And of course, you are fiddling with the facial nerve, you could damage it, but it's not, it's not sort of loose and flapping around and going to wrap around the drill. Um, you know, you could bruise it, but obviously, it's not working very well anyway. So, what are the benefits? Well, the studies that were done did show a reasonably convincing improvement in outcome. And certainly with uh, the temporal bone fractures, the people seem to recover an awful lot quicker if you decompress the nerve. Um, and, you know, if they do end up with a suboptimal outcome, they will at least feel that they did everything they could to. Uh, you know, get the best result. So basically, it's a short-term uh, cost uh, for a likely long-term gain. So here, it asks, uh, sorry, this came out slightly sort of distorted, but you know, this is a temporal bone fracture um, with a little, it's not a spicular bone, but there's a fracture line uh, with a sort of mobile segment running up to the geniculate ganglion. Um, this is okay this is a trick for finding the middle ear through the middle fossa where basically you put an endoscope in and transilluminate the middle ear cleft from below and whilst you look from above and you can see uh, where it is um, so then hopefully this video will play Okay, um, so <laughs> the bulgy things in the foreground are the heads of the ossicles. Um, that's just like a little bit of inflamed tissue. There's the facial nerve appearing uh, under that little fragment of bone, the big long white thing. Um, there we go. So 
picking off the bits of bone over the top of it. And, and then look, here is the fragment of bone that was mobilized by the fracture. So this is the bit that you could see fracture lines around, uh, which I've got to admit, there was a little bit of sort of a minor anxiety about grasping the big fragment and pulling it off the geniculate ganglion, but it came very nicely. And basically, you know, there was a sort of mobile fragment of bone sort of that had clearly pushed in uh, on the nerve. And the, uh, as you pull it out, you see the nerve underneath. Um, well, it wasn't really particularly mobile, I guess, at that stage. And then basically what you do is you follow the nerve, picking the bone off over the top of it. Um, let's do, we're just moving on to the next little bit of the topic. Um, longer term uh, paralysis. I mean, so basically uh, we get lots of letters saying, um, oh, please can you see this patient whose face doesn't move, who has had the facial palsy and hasn't recovered. And essentially this lady has a uh, post-paresis syndrome. Um, so a face which, or, or sort of frozen face type picture where the muscle contraction uh, interfering with movement. So the reason that she doesn't smile is not that uh, the uh, levator, you know, the levator muscles are not pulling, it's that the uh, depressor muscles are not relaxing. Uh, so that's the sort of post paresis syndrome. And then this is the sort of classic flaccid palsy, you know, the, the dropped angle of the mouth, the ectropium with the lower lid uh, coming away, um, generally sort of uh, contralateral muscles shortening because there's no opposing pull. Um, you know, the, the, the brows dropped, and the eyelid starting to contract. So, you know, completely different patients uh, with a completely different problem, but both referred as an ongoing uh, facial paralysis, but, you know, obviously not the same. And they don't need the same thing. So the postparesis syndrome, you know, they, it's a sort of common endpoint. Whatever it is that's damaged, that if the nerve is um, damaged but anatomically uh, intact, then it will often recover, you know, in a dysfunctional way, creating this sort of postparesis syndrome characterized by synkinesis. So lots of muscles contracting at once, which restricts movement, but also gives you that thing of, you know, you smile and your eye closes. And, and hypertonicity, so that the general sort of um, increased tone uh, inhibiting movement. Um, but it's not that the nerves not joined up and it's not that the muscles are not pulling, it's just that the end result is not movement. Um, the mainstay of treating that basically is therapy. So, um, you know, and, and in contrast to the acute flaccid palsy, you're stretching the affected side uh, for this. So bringing those muscles back out to length, sometimes using a little bit of Botox to affect them, sometimes using a bit of the Botox to reduce any hyperdynamic movement on the other side. Um, but it's basically a therapy thing. Uh, you can do operations. You can do something like a platysmectomy to, to stop that muscle contracting and, and pulling uh, the face down. You can remove any other little bits of muscle that you think are unhelpful. Um, to try and give a more lasting result than just using Botox to weaken the muscles. And sometimes you might try and boost the positive movement with something like a nerve to masseter facial anastomosis. Um, but in contrast, the patients with a flaccid palsy, what you do depends really whether, you know, do they have muscles, that, uh, a nerve that can be used? Um, and do they have muscles that can be used? Um, so if they've got working muscles, so they say they've had vestibular schwannoma surgery or something, and you know the nerve's not going to recover, you could do, uh, we, our go-to solution is a partial facial hypoglossal, so part of the hypoglossal nerve to the whole of the facial, which provides tone and uh, relatively natural movement. I mean, again, I suspect this video won't, no. Um, and uh, masseter to facial anastomosis to give them a smile. Um, but equally, cross-facial nerve grafts are good because you can get a spontaneous smile with that, but generally only used in the under 40s. Hard to believe that being over 40 could 
reduce your success rate, but that seems to be the case. Um, and, but if their flaccid palsy has been present for many years and the muscles haven't worked for years, then we would do something else like a temporalis transfer or uh, even a free muscle transfer, so a bit of gracilis. Um, and that can be driven by either a cross-facial graft or, uh, again, the nerve tenacity. Um, I realize I'm over an hour. Um, but luckily, that's pretty much the end. So, any questions? Yeah, thank you very much, Rupert. Yeah, there are a few questions. Uh, so, the first one was about the alternative classifications. So, in which way do you think uh, they are better? Which one do you think is better than the one. Well, the uh, Sony book is better um, because it's a much more sort of nuanced thing for, for assessing the impact of synkinesis um, and the treatment of that. Um, the problem with, um, I mean, basically, the, the purpose of a classification is primarily to allow people to communicate. Uh, and if everybody uses one system, then, you know, using something else is unhelpful. So I think, you know, basically we should probably just use House Brackman, but better than okay. we currently do. Uh, so what's your indication for facial nerve decompression then? Uh, well, depending on the circumstances. So uh, for a fracture, um, I would say that if the patient has a, a complete palsy, um, even if it perhaps considered to potentially delayed, then I would consider a decompression, particularly if I mean, some of the, to an extent, they're patient factors. Yeah. So if it's, um, you know, a, a young woman or, you know, uh, someone who, I mean, that sounds terribly sexist, doesn't it? There are lots of beautiful young men out there as well who equally care about their face. But you know what? If it's someone whose identity uh, and um, focus is very much associated with how they look, then they're going to be keener to have a decompression than someone. Uh, you know, perhaps more elderly and more worried about the rest of their health. Um, so basically, you know, people with temporal bone fractures with complete palsies, I would offer decompression to. Um, and patient, but if it's a uh, sort of Bells or Ramsey Hunt, then I would want them to meet those criteria in terms of denervation before considering it. Um, and if it's a recurrent facial palsy, then they basically have to have had three episodes and we normally say with an incomplete recovery. So the implication there being that they are going likely to continue having episodes and likely to continue deteriorating. Okay. And um, if you're planning to, group, to do a graft nerve uh, reanimation, which nerve would you recommend? Yeah, if I'm doing an interposition graft? Yes. Uh, well, normally just um, the greater auricular is kind of handy. Okay. I mean, it's nearby, it's long enough, it's about the right size. Um, it, you know, for cross facial grafts and things, you need to use sural nerve because you need something longer. But that I, the, I leave to the plastic surgeons. And then we have a colleague asking uh, if there is any way to know in the previous action graft if the pre-resection graft has actually started working before you do your resection? Yeah, um, well, yes, you can sort of, you know, stimulate the contralateral side. If you're doing a cross-facial graft, you can, st you can stimulate the contralateral side and see if both sides move. Um, if you're doing something like a nerve to masseter, it's probably a bit harder because, you know, because you can't really stimulate that proximally. It's too short and coming sort of at you but yeah for cross facial you can you can play around 
And then there is uh, another colleague that is asking, let's say that you have a patient with uh, a parotid tumor, okay, yep. with uh, a marginally involved, uh, marginally deteriorated facial nerve function, let's say an HB3. If that was a pleomorphic adenoma, what would you do? Do you leave a residual tumor? Do you sacrifice the nerve? I would not believe the cytologist who told me it was a pleomorphic adenoma. Yeah. I mean, unless they've had an intervention, a pleomorphic adenoma doesn't give you facial palsy. Yeah. Uh, I would be extremely suspicious. And then what is the success rate of facial nerve reanimation in flaccid facial paralysis? Well, if it's a relatively, if the muscles are good, i.e. it's being done, I mean, we, I, I think we're, we're perhaps a little bit harsh, but we would say we wouldn't, re, we would aim to, ideally you do the reanimation within a year of the insult, um, because it will take, you know, quite a long time to start working, six months or so. Um, certainly we wouldn't do it beyond two years, because if the muscles haven't worked for years, they're not going to work when you uh, provide them with a nerve supply. Um, but actually the success rate, it, it, it's really reliable. Um, and that's really important because what you don't want to do is do an operation um, and then say, oh, well, now we have to wait maybe a year to see if it works. And then say, oh dear, it hasn't worked. That's another year of your life wasted. So, you know, the, 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 the you have to do something reliable. Um, you, and the, the hypoglossal facial basically is reliable. Um, and that's, you know, one of its big attractions. And it provides a very natural looking tone. And you can keep a, uh, you only need to keep a, a, a little wisp of the hypoglossal nerve in order for their tongue to continue uh, working relatively normally. So the vast majority of the nerve is devoted to the face. Okay, we have a few more. So uh, if you believe in superficial parotidectomy for malignant parotid tumor, uh, where of course there could be the issue of a facial nerve involvement as well. Um, I think if you think the patient, um, well, there's two questions there. One is, should you do a superficial parotidectomy or a total parotidectomy? Uh, and the other is, um, is it reasonable to preserve the facial nerve in a patient with a malignant parotid tumor? I think the answer is, you know, you would normally do, uh, certainly if your um, preoperative testing suggests that it, or you think they've got a malignant parotid tumor, you'd normally do a total parotidectomy rather than a uh, partial. Um, but I think it is reasonable to preserve uh, the facial nerve um, that is away from the malignant tumor. So I don't think, you know, you have to sacrifice the nerve in every patient who's got a malignant tumor if the tumor is not, you know, directly abutting or invading the nerve. And then, you know, sometimes grafting, uh, you know, uh, a nerve uh, could be tricky. So which technique do you use? Do you suture it or do you just mm, put it close to the nerve and use T-seal? What would you... Uh, so in the... Um, parotid I stitch it together uh, and wrap a little bit of uh, fascia around it and use a bit of glue in if you're putting your graft in the um, temporal bone normally you know if you've got a like a good but a bony canal you can just lie it in I would just lie it at, you know place it so it's resting on something solid um, and intracranially uh, it's it's impossible to, it won't hold a suture because it doesn't have the same perineurium so you just have to wrap a little bit of fascia around it, around the two ends, like a, make it into a little tube and put some glue on and hope for the best. But those ones are the least reliable, I think, because sometimes they, they just, you know, by the, the patient sits up in recovery and the thing falls apart. Okay, well, thank you very much. Thank you for the excellent presentation. And I think we're done. Okay, pleasure.